Well, hello, everybody. My name is Andrea Merida, and you are joining us again uh, to talk to another one of the Green Party's presidential candidates. And this time we have Kent Mesplay, who um, is also from California. Strangely enough, California sends out a lot of uh, candidates. Um, and he's a longstanding uh, Green Party member and Green Party activist. Um, and the reason why we're doing this the, this chat is simply because the Green Party of Colorado is going to be choosing their presidential delegates for our national uh, nomination meeting in August. But our Colorado meeting is going to happen on April 3rd. And because, um, you know, we do want to reduce carbon footprint and all of these other things like this, we thought it would just be efficient to just have a conversation with the, the, five, del or the five people who are running for the Green Party's nomination. Um, in this case, this will allow the Colorado um, Green Party and, and our members to evaluate who is going to be in front of them when our meeting adjourns or convenes, I should say, on April 3rd. Um, and with us, as I said, is Kent Mesplay. Um, Kent is a very, very well-rounded individual. And just a few highlights about his background. You know, he has been a, a member of the Green Party since 1995 as a delegate. He's run for president before. Um, and very well-educated individual. He's got a PhD in biomedical engineering, emphasis on prosthetics, biomechanics, and efficiency of natural systems. Um, he most recently has been worked um, in uh, as a quality inspector for air pollution uh, for San Diego County, of course, in California. Um, very much environmentally uh, minded. Um, and, and very well versed on what um, industry has been doing to our environment. Um, so Kent, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away and tell us a little bit more about yourself um, and really what should people in Colorado know about you and why, um, why you're running and that sort of thing, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. It's uh, good to be here virtually. <clears throat> I'm actually in the desert in a conference room in a hotel between uh, Yuma, Arizona, and uh, Mesa, which is just next to Phoenix. That's where I'm headed today. <clears throat> so I was lucky to find a place that had a Wi-Fi signal, but then that didn't work out so well. So I'm, I'm pretty handy and adaptable. And I, I want to say that in this context regarding wanting to, to fix things, to improve things, I've known for a very long time that our political system is, is really rigged. Others have said it's fixed, but you know, not in a good way. It seems like an uphill battle. Um, I've been a member of both major parties and I quite frankly didn't see much difference and was delighted when I discovered the Green Party, which as those of us know who have been active is more than just about standing up for plants and animals. We have a strong social justice platform as well. Um, also, we are pro-peace. So when you think about having a true and a lasting peace and a shift away from the militarization and the empire building on this planet, think Green Party. And when you register with the Green Party, that's in a way your vote for peace. Uh, I grew up overseas in the uh, Eastern Highlands of the rainforest in Papua New Guinea. And there I grew up with people who were quite diverse. There were actually three different languages spoken at our station. And um, from, from the get-go, I've, I've been intrigued by people from around the world. We would have scientists and medical personnel visit us. And that's one reason I got into the sciences. Then I had trouble finding work. Then I had uh, various teaching positions until I found my position with the County of San Diego as an environmental regulator. And uh, since late last year, I've moved to Texas. So technically I'm now a Texan, yeehaw! Um, spending time in Austin and San Antonio and actually eager to leave that state. My girlfriend and I are talking about relocating just as soon as we can, which will be sometime after the convention early August in, I believe it's um, um, uh, Dallas or Houston? I, uh, in Houston. I have to double check. Houston, yeah. Not having been to either place. Yeah. Um, I, I've 
almost given up on the federal government being able to really solve our problems. In many respects, our federal government is part of the problem. And so those of us who are running are running to really change politics. I'm interested in improving our democracy, so we actually have one. And I talk a lot about basic physical security, not just the long wish list that we progressive have as far as single-payer health, affordable housing. Um, I talk about a credit-based public money system to change our monetary system, having public banks, moving to 100% renewable energy. Not just these issues, but we also need to take a second track and talk about revising our communities to um, local economic solution work, which many people are, are doing. But um, my point is that we need a built-in security of housing, food, energy at the local level, distributed manner. And at a guaranteed income, you see, landlords could just jack up the rent to the point where it's unbearable again. So we need some of this stuff built in so that we don't have brokers or, or middle people, if you will. So there, there's actually a, you know, I'm, I'm not really an advocate for big government. I work for the county government. I think governments at the local level, and it's San Diego gets really good ratings as far as counties go. It's the top ranked county uh, year after year. But when we go up to the federal level, we see that we really don't have representation. And I'm, I'm interested in improving our representation. I'm interested really in Native Americans having basically some representation. Uh, technically living on federal land, they really don't have anyone looking out for them. And the government comes in and swoops away land and, and resources at whim, doesn't respect the treaties, which ought to be time honored, and it's come up with all kinds of shenanigans. It, it'll take a Supreme Court reversal of something that was done in 1902 to 1903, wherein Congress was basically said, hey, you can basically disregard the treaties with the Indians. You don't have to follow them. So there's a lot to be done. Um, I, I like to fix things. I have an engineering background, and there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Particularly today, I want to reach out to Colorado Greens and encourage uh, Greens there to be involved with my campaign. Check me out at messplay.org. Sign up as a volunteer. I really am running full time this time. Uh, in the past, I've, I've run while well, working full time and done what I can. But now I'm actually in the process of building a team. And I've got some things to report on that that are positive, And perhaps that will come out. But I might have gone over my three minute intro if that's what I had. But yeah, I'm eager to, to take questions and, and hear what y'all have to say. Great, thank you. Um, you know, uh, you brought up two I interesting uh, issues there, and you know, I uh, well, in particular with regard to the Native Americans um, and the treaties. You know, we so so there's kind of a confluence of issues there for Colorado. For, first of all, mm -hmm. um, you know, you were just in Oak Flats, and you know where the federal right. government is is basically surrendering or wanting to surrender. Um, you know, our pristine and uh, habitats and, and, and wildlife areas to uh, private interests. Here in Colorado, we have a, a huge fight, as other states do, with fracking. Um, and right. we're, we've even put on, uh, we're, we're working to put on the ballot uh, a measure that would change our state constitution so that the mineral rights of a corporation would not supersede a town's ability, for example, uh, to say no to fracking within their boundaries. Now, we also have uh, a, a large concentration of Native American uh, people here. So I want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. You know, tell me a little bit about, you know, the federal responsibility towards maintaining, um, you know, the, I, I guess, sanctity of our, of, our, of our public lands. How does that interface with fracking? And what we can say about Native American rights at that point. And it's a strange confluence, but it's really not that strange. Go ahead. Right. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say that I, I oppose to fracking. Uh, there are a number of reasons why, uh, in part because what is injected into the ground doesn't have to be reported. So we don't know just how toxic it is. And in some uh, cases, it, it, you know, it really does threaten the groundwater. So in terms of being a threat to tribes and 
their rights to water, that's an issue. Uh, in, in terms of the federal government's responsibility, uh, originally the, the treaties were made with people who were seen as, as sovereign nations. They weren't being a minority, but as, as people who are so distinct and separate from one another that it's said that at the time of the European invasion, there were 500 different nations. So there's, there has been quite a bit of variety on this country in terms of language, in terms of culture. Not every Indian is alike. Um, but in terms of how the native have been treated, from the get-go, they have not been treated as human beings, which is why, of course, Columbus was said to have discovered. Well, he didn't discover anything. Others were here first. Uh, so the, it's, it's complicated and convoluted in that the U.S. government does have a responsibility to the tribes, but seen from a, a legal standpoint, there really is no enforcement capability what we lack is a separate independent organization is able to keep uncle sam to his word and and tell our federal government that it needs to um, respect the tribes so what we have are continuing incursions continuing infractions of the original treaties uh, it, it's as though the treaties when they were formed were made with ill intent people were caught between a rock and a, either the genocide would continue and they would be wiped out or they they would they would agree to stop fighting and that's what happened but in return they've had really less than nothing so um, in yeah it i in terms of all of the the interwoven legal issues a congress that is respectful of the cultural diversity that we have uh, we need a Supreme Court that is just, that will overturn uh, the 1902, 1903. And we really do need to respectfully, you know, treat at a federal level uh, na these nations as being the nations that they are. Uh, one of the problems, too, is that if a kid gets into to trouble on the reservation, it's automatically a federal issue. In some places, there are contracts with uh, the local sheriffs. So there, there's quite a bit of variability. But really what it comes down to is there is no independent agency that is with, with enforcing uh, the, these contracts. And they are contracts. Uh, people on the political so-called right talk a lot about, about values. Well, personal and more global responsibility is a, a key uh, value. So we, part of it's, I think, a matter of education. Uh, a lot of people in office, of course, are European American, and we have to address, and really a, an outright, if we talk about Oak Flats, uh, rather Oak Flat, which is in the um, um, uh, Tonto National Forest, and it's about 80 miles or so east of Phoenix. This is a traditional sacred land that's used by the San Carlos Apache in their coming of age rituals. So it's very, it's not just that they do this on a whim, but sometimes I, I really think our federal government, especially the right wingers, for all their, their talk of, of being Christian, et cetera, they really don't, you know. People in office, we see the front runners in one of the in repulsive places. They really don't have a clue as to, to what is grossly disrespectful. Um, so I was at Oak Flat. I camped overnight. I met with the medicine man. He said he would be my advisor. And I was fortunate to receive a blessing. And I, I was um, granted some privileges and honors that... Um, Someone there, another Apache fellow, said he was stunned by this normally allow this rights. I thought, well, that you know, that that means something to me. Then, I, then I thought, wait a minute. I did tell them I have Blackfoot heritage, and that that's part of who I am as well. So, one of the things I'd like to do is help the tribes work together better, uh, in part in order to uh, face down climate change in a good way. And as the U.S. government is on a downward spiral, 
support collapse. I would like to see one be a chair of our United States government uh, completely, completely collapses. So we don't have a lot of time, but the, the solutions really in part to live more sustainably help us all. So uh, I am interested more generally, and I am interested in global peace. That's one of my issues as well, which I do believe we can have within my lifetime. I do think it's right around the corner, but uh, there's a lot to be done. So, yeah. Well, what, what, you know, along those lines of global peace, um, what what's the plan to get there? Right? What specific uh, things can the office of the president actually do to get us there? Well, one thing candidates on the way to the White House is talk about the eight million dollars a day that goes into Israel. This isn't uh, there to Im improve the situation uh, at a federal level. Uh, we we really need to do uh, and to transform our military. See, all of these social programs that we talk about are, are going to come at a cost. And of course, we'd like to see the federal budget not just trimmed, but really cut it, it could at least be cut in half back to levels from the 1990s. Um, but I think the way to make this work, and this is where I distinguish myself as a candidate, is to talk about transformation, a rapid transformation of our military funding over to these other our security issues. Climate change is a security issue. And when we use the language of the right, instead of positioning ourselves so far to the left, I, I think it makes, you know, it makes sense and we're, we're a little more... Um, a little more successful, I think, in our presentation if we use that language. And a lot of green news really are security issues. So that, I think, will help us tremendously in the general election, rather than positioning ourselves as being way off to the, lot, to the left. These, these left-right perspectives and the issues of communism versus capitalism really are, are sort of blanket statements, wherein, in reality, we have a, a much more amorphous situation. Uh, for example, because of, um, of, of corporate welfare, we have gross gifts to corporations, the huge subsidies to the uh, petroleum industry, which ought not to be there. But uh, people usually don't call that what it is, which is, is welfare. So even if we use free market forces, we're not doing it very smartly. Um, the problem, the, the risk that's associated with our energy supply, for example, nuclear power, that's put on the shoulders of taxpayers, but the benefits, of course, go to shareholders. So just, just by being consistent, for example, <clears throat> if we're, we're failing, they should have been allowed to fail. So even within the capitalist system, there are improvements that can be made, but we really do need to to re-knit that, that safety net, that social safety net, which has been severely frayed, and close the gap between the hats, which is one of the biggest indicators that our government is failing. Uh, because basically our politicians are hired guns for the ultra-rich, and that's just how it is. And to, to solve our problem, we need newer people in office, but we also need to promote a philosophy of abundance rather than this one of scarcity and lack. So in terms of peace, the more generous we are, uh, the, the more willing we are to reach out to those who we perceive as our enemies, the greater chance we have at achieving a lasting peace. But because of fear and this sort of lockdown mentality, the direction is going the other way. The, the idiots on the far right, of course, would would completely bankrupt our nation on military spending and, and not give it a second thought. And that type of behavior is how societies collapse. So we need to swing the pendulum the other way. And we really don't have much time because of climate change and social unrest. And we have no we have no no world government, no international. We see this with Fukushima. We see this with climate refugees who do not have anyone looking out for them. Uh, the United Nations, of course, has little to no enforcement capabilities. So we really do need a government, even at an international level, that works for us all. But again, I, I advocate for a smaller government rather than larger government and for local solutions. 
Great. Thank you. Um, and you did kind of uh, make uh, you, you did allude within those uh, the last remarks there um, something about the positioning uh, of, of either left or right that the Green Party should um, it, it, it probably articulate. Uh, we did have a question from one of our Colorado Greens um, that is kind of related to that. Um, and Sean would like to know about what obstacles and opportunities do you think that are facing the Green Party um, during this election cycle um, and what you personally are doing to overcome some of those obstacles and take advantage of the opportunities? Well, that, you know, that, that is a, a big question. Of course, we have the senator from Vermont who has run largely on a green platform, though his foreign is really lacking, speaking of Israel. Um, so what's happening now is uh, we're, we're reaching out across party lines. A lot of young people are involved. Uh, I've been networking with, with tribal people and with those in, in this other campaign. And uh, we're talking about, uh, about what to do, depending on who the nominee is for that other corporate party. Uh, but regardless, what you know, the challenge for me as a Green Party candidate has, has been um, in every four-year cycle to say, no, we have to stand fast. We have to be solid as Greens, remain registered as Greens, vote as Greens, because that's how we build the party, rather than hoping beyond hope that that change is going to happen uh, from within one of the corporate parties. Uh, as David Cobb, our president uh, nominee in 2004 said, the Democrat Party is the place where progressive ideas go to die. And I think that's still the, the case today. Young people, you know, wonderfully and naive though they may be, think that there's actually going to be a possibility of transformation slash reformation with, within the, 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 well, party of donkeys. But um, the problem is that it's one uniparty. It's the party of donkeys and asses or the duopoly or Tweedledum and Tweedledumer. They're, they're both really in bed with, with big business. And it's that money that is an obstacle because we don't get the free airtime. Uh, the, um, the, the crazy person on the, the far right, uh, he's received about $2 billion of free airtime. Whereas, you know, it occurred to me the other day, hey, don't we have two PhDs from Northwestern University running as candidates? I think Kreml received his PhD from there. Haven't double checked it, but, you know, we've, we've got very thoughtful, motivated, intelligent, active people running at the top of the ticket or bottom, however you look at politics, in the Green Party. And, and this, you know, we will build a party by by building the base. So, you know, we're, we're hearing this again that, well, if we, if we support the, the green, then that's gonna, you know, it's the lesser evil is in voting. We're, we're gonna one who is worse. And, and my, my take on that, and this is something I haven't heard others say. So, you know, as long as you're recording, I'd like to get some credit for this. Um, when you register green and you do it now and you do it soon, you are registering a vote against I'll say his name, against Donald Trump. You're registering a vote against this corrupt, dangerous system um, and registering a vote for peace. Most people don't realize that there's so much room for growth in politics in the United States. It, it's not advertised that most people don't vote, and it's not advertised that, um, that there are many people who could who are, are qualified uh, to vote, but they need to be registered. So actually the people who are making the decisions and, and determining the elections are a very small slice of the pie. So what we need to do is move quickly, get as many people registered green as possible. So there's the you know, Bernie but bust movement. And I've been advocating this. You know, it's like similar ideas are popping up at the same time. It's like for those of you who are supporting that candidate and you know that we need to have a more progressive government that represents all of us. Well, the day after you vote for your candidate of choice, vote again. And you vote again by registering with the Green Party. 
Um, there's, there's so much lack of understanding, too, uh, regarding politics in this country and the distinction between the primary slash caucus season and our general election. Of course, to vote in the general election, your opinion really doesn't matter. So another reason that if your favorite favorite candidate is not in the Green Party, but you're registered Green, you can still vote for him or her, I would say, you know, in alliance um, from Vermont. But, you know, someone asked me, well, what will you do if, if he gets the nomination? I said, well, that'd be great. Then we would have two progressives in the debates and we would really talk about the the the, those who are poor. We would talk about homelessness as an issue. We would talk about how people are disabled or not given enough that they can survive. And, you know, have solutions to all these. These groups are problematic to the status quo, not because they don't work, but because they do work. And because they do work, they threaten our consumption-based economy, which is based on using things up and throwing them away. So, yeah, I mean, my challenge is to, to build my, my team. So welcome on board. I recently signed someone up as my assistant treasurer. Um, I've been reaching out to celebrities for years, and I got a taker a couple of months ago. So I, I do have a running mate, but I've been holding off uh, because I want to be better ready to announce. And there have also been some issues regarding uh, our particular stance on on some things, speaking of peace and Israel. Uh, but this will help draw attention to the party once I announce. So I'm definitely running and I'm definitely in the race and I do have some catching up to do regarding uh, getting delegates. And you know the, the challenge is is really to to organize and to not get browbeaten by those who say that we're you know that we're taking votes away. We actually enhance the race. I think you know, not as in, as in enhanced torture, but you know, we, we are our political system and we bring people in. Ralph Nader did that years ago. If you look at the numbers and you really think about what happened, Gore would have lost by even more than he did in Florida in 2000 if Nader hadn't been in the race. And back to our issues being, you know, the term he used, Nader used, was majoritarian. Our issues are majoritarian. They really affect everyone. It is something that cuts across international boundaries. It cuts across party lines. And in a way, this could be viewed as the common enemy that could unite humanity. Uh, but we've got to move quickly. And, and here in the United States, we really have to punch through that glass ceiling in politics. So, you know, punch through with a green fist. And it's okay to move quickly sometimes. If we move too slowly, the system will morph and change and take away our power. And we're, we have a perfect opportunity right now with a frightening demagogue being the shoe-in for one party and then the usual oligarch is the shoe-in for the other. Uh, so, you know, I cool the green Kool-Aid, but I really do believe we can have a green president or we can at least have really high numbers and, and blow past that. 5% threshold that, that is so important to maintaining uh, ballot lines. Yeah, great. Um, you know, it, it, it should be stated too, as far as, you know, some of those naysayers out there that, you know, the pool of people that actually vote is actually quite small. It's maybe only about 30% of, of the total possible voters that might be out there. And so um, right. if they're worried about having their votes taken away, then they haven't seen the 65 to 70 percent of people who could vote but don't because they don't have confidence in their in, in those candidates. And so, you know, I, I, if you'll allow me to editorialize. Um, sure. But I want to redirect you to um, a topic that's actually quite important for um, the metro area of Denver um, along the I-25 corridor, really. And that's the issue of, of homelessness. Um, Denver is actually mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the places in this country where uh, homelessness is actually criminalized. And, and we say that to mean there's been yeah. ordinances that have been passed. Um, you know, you can't rest and have some sort of covering on you because then you would be camping and we have a camping ban in, in Denver. Right. Um, right. You, you know, and, and, and so and we're not the only city in the country that has this problem. Um, and, and often this is seen as a very local problem, but, um, you know, what do you think? Are there federal implications for it? What are some of the federal uh, uh, solutions that could come um, out of the president's cabinet? Okay. Uh, 
Well, I haven't thought specifically of that issue. I, I wanted to back up just for a moment and put this in the, the broader perspective. Pueblo, Colorado, when we moved to the States, we moved to Pueblo. My dad was born in the Springs, and most of my uh, family are in Colorado, stepmother, both sisters, their husbands. So Colorado really is my home state more than any other. But back in 1976 or so, I, I was talking to my dad, and we were looking at the newspaper, and, and he said, you know, Kent, the, the social conditions are kept just above the point where people would riot, where they would rebel. And now what is, because of lack of representation and because of the fox not just guarding the hen house, but you know, in the, the coop just wiping out the, the chickens, what we're seeing is that uh, the conditions are, are so bad that you know, we, we have had riots. Uh, we, you know, rather than, rather than address the problem, our, our oligarchs are, of course, supporting the wealthy, and their solution is to take an enforcement approach. Uh, there's something similar in Austin. It's a 30-minute rule. You can't remain seated or lying down in a public place for more than 30 minutes. So uh, homelessness is criminalized and also being a debtor is being criminalized. This, this, you know, it indicates, it indicates toward an Orwellian, you know, fascist regime where I, I use fascism to say corporatist. We have this tie-in between corporations and the government. So a longer term solution is to break that tie to, to have campaign finance rules, but specifically what can be done for people who are homeless um, I think enacting emergency measures by saying, look, this isn't a state of emergency in the state in terms of, say, a hurricane, a flood, or a fire displacing those who have homes, but we already have a state of emergency because for those who, who are trying to survive, who, who don't have a roof over their heads. So I, I think one could use that and use that, that approach legally because it's true. The, the problem is uh, those who don't have the monetary means, in effect, to purchase our politicians have very little clout. So we need people in office who are, are uh, sympathetic and, and understanding and compassionate, usual sociopaths. So this is a bigger cultural problem. Um, but yeah, and what else could be done? I, I remember in, in California, people self-organized and set up homeless camps and then schwarzenegger came in and and had the camp quote unquote you know which means that they were eradicated when we don't really address the root of any problem we're not solving the problem we're maybe just sweeping it under the carpet um so in terms of green solutions we could use this situation as an impetus for creating sustainable regions for example uh to have uh to have we could use motor homes to end homelessness one of the people contacting me had had that idea and i told him i knew someone else who had that idea as well so that we can move people and locate them in a hurry create sound solid uh, uh, local economies and, and the way to, to make this work is, I don't know if there would be FEMA funding or, or what, but we really aren't prepared for any emergencies. And, and if we look at people who are already homeless and use that as a model for what we're going to do when we have the big earthquakes in California, or we have these firestorms that, that ravage uh, Southern California from time to time, you know, we, we're not prepared for that, but yeah, you know, we could put these models into place that would that would and and do it using federal um, oversight and federal funding, and do it in a way that will be instructive that will help us to be uh, more prepared for emergencies. So I think we could put that under uh, emergency preparedness. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great question, and you know it's something near and dear to me. Uh, I lost a friend recently to what appeared to have been a suicide because she was afraid of becoming homeless again. You know, she was older and had health issues and the health issues weren't being addressed. 
Um, so, you know, th these aren't just pie in the sky ideas. People really are hurting out there. And I, I saw it as, a, um, as an inspector for the air pollution control district in one auto body shop. The owner had set up a bedroom in, in, his, in his shop for he and his wife so that his children could live at home. And, you know, this is, you know, the, the, the economic situation is far more dire than one would believe if one just, you know, listened to the idiot box and, you know, to our idiots in office. Great. So, and that's actually a, a, a new idea that I myself have not heard before to treat the homelessness as a preparation for a disaster prepare, preparedness. So uh, that that's very interesting. I want I want to pivot a little bit more. You you did start talking about you know getting to a a, a place of peace of world peace, and I think mm -hmm. it's generally accepted within the Green Party that wars for oil are kind of an agitating factor and. We, you know, absolutely need to be uh, looking at ways to get away from uh, from our oil and, and petroleum use. Um, so, you know, we had a question earlier from uh, one of our friends, Mark from uh, Oklahoma, um, who wanted to ask for your specific ideas about how to promote clean power versus petroleum, nukes, et cetera, and specifically what the office of the president can do to promote that. Well, one is to make it more difficult uh, uh, to extract, to not allow leases. Uh, that would help in, in the case, I think, of, of Oak Flat uh, to not, yeah, on federal property, uh, the, the leases have to be approved and uh, the, the, the office of the, the president can deny those leases. Um, in terms of, of the funding, we need to cut just outright end all subsidies for petroleum, uh, for natural gas, which although it's cleaner isn't, you know, we don't need to have natural gas and the, the, with fracking it, 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 it makes it dirty and, and coal of co course too. So the, the thing that mo many people don't realize is that we do have the technology to run our country 100% on renewables. And to do that, a study was done, I think it was by NOAA, but I'm not really sure. But we, we can have that by 2030. And I've been saying, look, on the reservations, let's have 100% renewables by 2024. You know, bump it up a little because uh, their traditional methods of energy gathering, for example, have been curtailed. Um, so I, I think education to uh, anyone who's, who's running, who talks about energy issues, needs to know that the, the, the best way uh, to improve things is to address efficiency first. When our buildings are insulated so that they don't lose them or gain as much heat in the summertime, and, and that ties into our economic wisdom plank. When we have that, when we work more with nature, for example, the siting, of windows so that if you have southern exposure you aren't overheating uh, the building from that exposure but you, you use that in the the winter time so we need smarter buildings green buildings are actually called smart buildings because they they're so resourceful um so yeah and we we do need some more uh you know, I, I do believe in subsidies for for the right things. Overall, I'm I'm pretty much opposed to subsidies, but um, uh, the economy needs a strong nudge in the right direction. So I I had studied wind power quite a bit in the past. A good friend of mine had invented a an exciting turbine, but then you know there's corruption that goes on, and it, it's like a story that could be out of Hollywood. That, but you know there. People are proposing solutions. There are better ways of producing and storing energy. But the problem is if you come up with too good a solution, then it's squelched. So inventors are, you know, disappeared. This is something that my, my friend had told me. So, you know, if you're young and you think you can contribute to society by inventing something, you really need to be aware that there are really strong forces that will work against you if it appears to be a threat. The best thing an individual can do is improve their energy efficiency. Um, yeah, so yeah, just if if we do a direct economic comparison, and and we treat 
even within the capitalist model, right? If, if we treat um, if we treat nuclear power fairly and we look at the full cycle cost and we, we put the entire cost of, of the whole process from start to finish on the shoulders of the shareholders, they wouldn't go for it because it, it, it wouldn't make sense. And, and if we put a monetary value on the sickness from, from radiation exposure and the, you know, we really don't have a way to, to deal with the waste that is is ethical um, when, when we when we do that even under a, an economic lens if, if we treat it fairly it doesn't make sense so we need to get away from from these more uh, damaging forms of, of energy uh, just you know green green solutions you know really work but if we're all off grid and we have more time to spend with family and friends here in the event of an emergency and we're growing more of our own food, including medicinals, and we don't have to work so much, then that removes the umbilical cords that the powers that be have on us and over our lives. But really, the, the Green Party is also an independence movement for those who really haven't thought it through. Um, and we are concerned about our loss of, of civil liberties. So it all kind of ties together. Uh, but again, I, I do like to I'll refer back to transformation. The faster we transform toward being a society fully based on renewables, the better. I mean, we had streetcars. I, I met someone in California who remembered the good old days of how it only took him a nickel to go all the way from inland out to the uh, the ocean. And this was cost effective. You know, pooling our resources and helping each other out really makes sense. We need to get away from this cutthroat uh, economic uh, model, the, the corporatist slash, you know, capitalists, the, the really ugly side of capitalism that is is destroying our country. And of course, you know, those who know about history know that the, the tracks were torn up and the, the streetcars were, were dropped into the ocean uh, because a company wanted to sell rubber tires. So, you know, we need a break. You know, I, I can't say this enough. We need a break between big business and politics. That's that's why our political system is so corrupt. Lobbying is legalized bribery. We really need to address that. Until we address that, we're going to see very slow progress on on all of these solutions. And and we need we need to enact these solutions. You know, these are life or death issues now with climate change. So thanks. Good question. Long answer. Yeah. And now. You, you touched on a few things um, uh, with regard to, well, let me, I'll just ask the question. We, we got a question from our friend Timothy. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and it's, a, it's a really important question given the, the current political tone that's out there. But yeah. how do you plan to overcome the current culture that's polarized the U.S. government? And what would you do to uh, incentivize cooperation and, and, and move forward? Well, in, in terms of the presidential race, we need to have a lot more fun with this than we've been having. Uh, the four of us non-frontrunner candidates have been working together to support each other, provide each other with information. And, you know, I can tell you, people have been busy. I mean, our front runners had a four-year, a wonderful job, but the rest of us are, are getting out there as well. And when I announce with the celebrity running mate, that'll instantly get some attention. And I intend to have fun with that because I'm running in part as a, as a protest candidate, you know, a hopeful protest, right? But nonetheless, I, I really want people to know how much power they have. And, and I can't say this enough, just the act of registering green is revolutionary. If you don't like to vote, if you never vote, if you don't want to vote, just registering green and helping the green party get on the ballot is is an enormous contribution when we will see you know just just how much support there is and 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 we'll we'll get these solutions into place but you know of course the presidency is a position of, of quite limited power even the president is is basically a, a puppet but uh it the the, there are executive orders, and there there is some power in that in that position. Um, I I talk about generosity uh, in in traditional uh, Native American cultures. There's something called a giveaway, 
and the person who has a lot gains status by by selectively giving away what he or she has to those who are recognized as being needy. This is a way of distributing wealth and resources and supporting those across the spectrum. This is in sharp contrast to what we have today, which is a bunch of wealthy people basically picking the pockets of the poorest among us, right? So we have this, this growing gap between the haves and have nots. So being generous, being kind to ourselves and being patient and generous with others goes a long way. Um, I mean, I, I, I try to be polite, but when I, I see what is happening in our presidential race. I'm not surprised. I'm thoroughly disgusted, but yeah, you know, outside our party, let me say. <laughs> um, but I, I'm not surprised. And and as far as uh, peace in the Middle East, peace among among Jews and, and Palestinians, it, it really will take one side to take the higher road and and reach out to the other side with extreme generosity. And then we'll see things shift. Uh, but right now, it's this, you know, I, it, it's this grabbing type of mentality that that is is part of our quote unquote white culture. Um, the Lakota have a term for white people. I, it's wasichu, which basically means um, one who takes the best part. And it, you know, you can say, well, that you know, a synonym is pig, but you know, pigs are intelligent animals, so I wouldn't want to associate them with that behavior but it's someone who just knowingly goes in and and takes away from others it, it it's a behavior that is supposed to be um supposed to be weeded out and disciplined out and you know even loved out of, of children but instead we see with um with one of the mainstream candidates you know he's He's basically a, he's, he's stuck in adolescence. He's, he never went through a coming of age ritual and he appears to be a wealthy, successful man, but he's, he's juvenile in his behavior. It's fine if you are a juvenile, you will hopefully grow out of it. But th this is a cultural problem. It, it's, a, it's this, this scarcity, uh, materialistic uh, mentality. But people who live in more tribal societies share when I grew up in Papua New Guinea, I grew up with Pacific Islanders and the people were, were starving. My father was an advocate for them. I mean, you're in a rainforest, you're starving, right? Might not make sense, but there's not a lot to eat in the, the jungle. It, it's not just this lush um, salad bowl that people think it is. But the, the way that people survive is to share because if, if you have extra there will likely be a time when someone else has extra you're hurting and then that comes around and that's so antithetical to the the competitive model that we have right now and we need to get away from that very simple you know we, we don't even need to legislate all this you can't behavior a lot of it comes from parenting but you know parents need to teach their children to be respectful and patient and honor their their elders and in an in Indian country to learn their language and hold on to it and, and to be patient and to be generous. Um, you know, even someone who doesn't have much can be generous with their time. And our, our behavior as a culture is quite the opposite. So just anyway, thank you. Good question. <laughs> Great. Um, and, you know, we just have a few more, a couple of more minutes left. Um, and we did get a, a really great question earlier um, and briefly, if you would, just kind of like as a closing remark to incorporate this idea of what your vision for the next five years looks like. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Greens are successful when we get into debates. We have, I think, over 100 Greens in elected positions, many of them uh, nonpartisan. Uh, you don't have the name Green after the name when you go to vote for them. Green's in office, and I, I see at least a, a tripling of green office holders. I, I don't say that lightly. A tripling to quadrupling of, of green office holders in the U.S. I think we'll have our first green senator in part from a conversion or two. That will really help bolster the party. 
uh, but we'll see more green legislators. And, and we need people who, who see how the system is, who are basically green, to run for public office. Uh, in, in terms of, yeah, the, the rest of society, we're, we're really at an end time. Uh, the earth is changing. It's not just about climate change. And it, it's difficult to know where we're going to land. But I, I try to be optimistic that the super storms and the, the climatic chaos that we have, that's going to continue for a while. Uh, so I, I see humanity is coming together. I think put an end to war, if not sooner. An end to all wars. We're on drugs. We're on this, that, and the other. And just get away from the whole war mentality and and move toward sharing and toward a true, genuine, lasting peace. We have the ability. We just don't have the political will. And uh, again, just being generous really went a long way. Great. Um, well, that's that's quite a vision, um, and it looks like we all have a, quite a bit of impact in how that shapes out, so I appreciate that. Um, and just to let everyone know, um, our website is coloradogreenparty.org, um, so we will be posting these videos there as well. But if you're on YouTube, please check us out. Uh, just search for Colorado Green Party um, in the YouTube search bar, and um, you can subscribe to our channel. We're going to be doing these kinds of things more often in the future. Um, we've got a couple more candidates that we're going to be talking to tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to thank Kent for his time. And it was, uh, you know, difficult and it's very hot where you are. So I appreciate <coughs> your coming out and making this, <coughs> this time. Um, just, to, uh, just, to reiterate, just to reiterate, our state meeting where we're going to be choosing our delegates is April 3rd. Um, here um, in Centennial, which is a community outside of Denver. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, discussing what you've discussed today. And thank you very much. Thank you. I, I look forward to having support from Colorado. And uh, by the way, I have a sister and brother-in-law who live in Centennial. So that is quite... Um, yeah, uh, a lot of this happening. So come on board, mesplay.org, M-E-S-P-L-A-Y.org. Thank you, Andrea, for having me on. I enjoyed it. Thanks very much. And Colorado wishes you luck on your campaign. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. S to you. Bye.